So, Associate Professor John Morgan is a passionate advocate for grassland conservation, management and restoration. From the tiny plants to the dominant grasses, he has championed the, their importance and beauty for nearly 30 years. He's pragmatic too. Grasslands might be small and often weedy, but John has focused on the mantra to recover the ecosystem. First, you have to save all the parts. To do that, he has studied the germination of species, detailed how long plants live, measured their response to fire, and looked at ways to recover the connections that make grasslands tick. Most importantly, he works to bring the local community along for the ride. So John is going to present to us on looking to the future, where should we be focusing our efforts for grassy ecosystem conservation and restoration? So over to you, John. Thanks, Aggie, and you can see my screen okay? Yep, perfect. Thank you. And thank you for that lovely introduction and also the talks we've had earlier this morning. Uh, I'm speaking from Wurundjeri country, but specifically from my car. So I'm hoping the connection will hold up for you today. I want to get you to think a little bit today and I, I'm happy if you disagree with me. I want to challenge you, but I think we need to think about what does the next 20 years look like? Okay. It's just not going forward for me. There we go. There we go. So the plains grasslands, as we know, are very diverse, and Amy's done a lovely uh, introduction to that. But just to put it into some context, uh, for plant species at least, anyway, they're really important because they hold about a third of Victoria's plants, and around 100 of those are grass species, and we tend to forget about those. We tend not to put lots of photos up about grasses. Since 1986, the Victorian Volcanic Plains has been a really important area, a hotspot as it were, for identifying new species. And last year at this event, Neville Walsh talked about the fact that 39 new species had been identified that seemed to be endemic to the Victorian Volcanic Plains. So in a biological sense, they're really, really important and their conservation is crucial. Uh, we know most of it's been lost and we don't need to harp on that. That's the big conservation challenge. The best bits are typically in public land on roadsides, but there's a lot of this vegetation in private hands. And so it's how do we get to manage both aspects and improve uh, those remnants that perhaps aren't in great condition. That's the challenge. How many species have we lost from the Victorian volcanic plains? I'll get you just to think of a number. Out of that 900, how many do you think have been lost from this system? Hopefully you've got a number in mind. Well, the numbers depend on what you're asking. If you're talking about global extinction of a species that is on the Victorian volcanic plain, well, it's none. One's very close to it, Diurus fragrantissima, which is the sunshine diurus, almost extinct in the wild. I'm happy for people to point out if they think these numbers aren't right. We do know of two species that are no longer found on the plains that are still found elsewhere in Victoria. That's the yellow eyebright, Euphrasia scabra, which is, as it turns out, a parasite, so it parasitizes other plants, and Thesium australe, which was known to grow around uh, places like Skipton back in the day. So at one level, despite all that habitat loss, we have an opportunity to conserve most of the flora because it still exists somewhere in the landscape. But should we get complacent? Well, short answer to that is no way, Jose. Some work by Ben Zeeman, and a PhD student of mine a few years ago uh, showed the dire state in which grasslands exist. This is a grassland occupancy map. How many species occur at each grassland site? And it's primarily confined to around Melbourne, you can see those areas in yellow. What I want you to take from this graph is that more than 110 grassland sites across Melbourne and greater Melbourne and outer Melbourne contain fewer than five native species. So the vast majority of grasslands were species poor. And you can see at the right hand end of the graph, very few sites were species rich, meaning contain most of the species. So this has a a real conservation concern here. A, if we lose some of those species rich sites, we lose most of the species from the plains. So we can't afford that. But the sites on the left hand side suggest that these sites have probably degraded or lost species. And what can we do with those grasslands rather than just write them off? Because they're the vast majority of sites, they're species poor. 
And so the work that John Delpratt and others and Paul Gibson Roy, who would talk after me, have been doing is thinking about how do you enhance diversity? Really critical work. Now I'm going to walk you through a couple of ideas here. If we think of this grassland here as the whole of the Victorian volcanic plain, so 250 years ago, it stretched from Melbourne down towards the South Australian border. What's obviously happened is we've lost habitat and it's become smaller and smaller and smaller through time. So we can represent that by a series of you know, declining boxes. So it's sort of sensible that we would therefore have fewer species in our grasslands based on their area, their size. So maybe one thing that's going on is that just most of our grasslands are really small and don't support many species, but inappropriate management probably has also contributed to this. Now as a biologist, we really worry about this idea. If we think about the number of species, so our y-axis here is how many species persist in a landscape, there's been some nice work done all over the globe in grasslands that show we would expect to see species decline or be lost from grasslands as we lose more and more of their habitat. So that's the line that you can see. So at 100% of habitat, you've got 100% of species, and as you get down to 40% of habitat, you might have 75% of species still present and so on. Now, what's really, really interesting is when people went out and looked for the number of species persisting in various locations in grasslands primarily all over the globe, they found this really interesting relationship that most sites, whether they be the black triangles here or the, the crosses here, sit above the line. So what that means is despite the fact we've lost lots of habitat, most habitats or most grasslands are maintaining more species than we would put on the evidence of available habitat. And that's what we're seeing on the Victorian volcanic plains. But let's not get complacent here. This particular little doozy over here is the grassland uh, part of the study that was done in Melbourne. And so you can see Melbourne has lost most of its grasslands, probably about 90%, 95%. We don't need to quibble about the numbers. And yet we've maintained of the known species that were in these grasslands around Melbourne, about 95% of the species. But what that says is over time, we might expect to lose, if we lost no more grasslands, and we know that's not true, if we lost no more grasslands, perhaps species will start to drop out of these systems and eventually head down towards that line. That's the predicted number of species at that habitat proportion. So shockingly, shockingly, we expect to lose 44% more species or perhaps over 500 species in coming decades or centuries. And this is a concept called the extinction debt. Species are hanging around, but ultimately go extinct as they dwindle away. And perhaps that process has already started. So that's a really key challenge for us to think about how do we manage grasslands to ensure A, we can prevent this from happening, but we actually improve the proportion or the area of grassland in which these species can persist. That gives us a bit of hope, actually. Perhaps it's not too late. We've still got most of the species, we've lost most of the habitat, we've been talking about that for a long period of time. So what the hell are we gonna do to prevent this from happening? That becomes the crux of the question. So clearly we need to enhance protection of these areas. And we've been doing a lot of that work over the last 30 years. That includes identifying sites, putting fences up, getting inappropriate disturbances out, things such as four wheel driving and stuff like that. We've got to manage these sites. They've got weeds, they've got fire requirements. They've got all sorts of landscape context problems, uh, whether that be urban or agricultural areas. So we've got to manage them. We know that. And I see in the chat box, you know, how we do that still needs to be uh, expressed uh, to many people. We've got opportunities for restoration. And so Paul Gibson Roy, speaking after me, has pioneered with John Delpratt how to restore grasslands from scratch. But what I want to talk about today is what else should we be thinking about? What have we either not got on the radar? What have we forgotten about? What should we actually do? I'm going to start in a really curious place, probably one that you wouldn't think. I've got five things I want to cover. And so the first one is a focus on the inch flora. And you'll see why in a moment. 
Now, if you don't know what I mean, uh, that's because you're too young to know what an inch is. Uh, we're talking small plants, maybe 2.5 centimetres tall or less, an inch. And so here we've got a fantastic example of one of those inch flora called Hyalosperma demissum from the daisy family. Isn't it gorgeous? Now, annual plants have some really big challenges in life. And I just want to touch briefly on what those challenges are. Now, I'm going to use a non-local example. This is a little uh, annual plant that happens to inha inhabit waterways. But if you think about it, they're tiny. So they're, we don't see them, obviously. But biologically, that means they've got lots of stresses. They've got to compete with lots of bigger plants. You know, they don't weigh much. You know, so how the hell do they make a living? Uh, as I said, they're tiny. If you know what a mountain ash is, the world's tallest flowering plant, which occurs in the Dandenongs just up the road from me, they're 165,000 times shorter. That's going to put you at some disadvantage. And if you compare them next to a giant redwood, I mean, we all know what they are, they're seven trillion times lighter in, in, in mass. So you think, wow, these plants have some real disadvantages here. So why is this important for Victorian volcanic plains? Well, on the VVP, there's a whole range of plants that are be both beautiful in their own right, but also easy to overlook. So I'm just gonna go through a few of them. If they're new to you, that's great. That means that we don't have them on our radar at all. This one here used to occur at Skipton, uh, near the Skipton Common, don't think it does anymore. Isn't this fantastic? You might be aware of the trigger plants, the perennial ones that we've all gone along and triggered to get them to, uh, shoot, where well, you get annuals. Here's Stylidium despectum. Fantastic thing, isn't it? Gorgeous. Another little daisy. This one does hang around a little bit uh, more, possibly because it's a touch bigger than most annuals. Triptilodiscus pygmaeus. It's funny, pygmaeus meaning small. It's actually the biggest of the annuals. Uh, so really, um, these plants do have a bit of a challenge. One of my favorite groups, the Centralepus uh, group. Uh, here's a little hairy one here called Strigosa. Uh, look at this, Levin hookia. This is related to those trigger plants. It just doesn't have the trigger. Fantastic little thing. Now, if you've seen any plants growing across the VVP, all good for you because they're actually really rare now. Indeed, almost all of them have disappeared across most of their range of the Victorian volcanic plains. And we did a survey just recently thinking about the species we knew of on the VVP, and that comes from observations of early botanists by Sutton and Patton back you know, 100 years ago or more. And we put our heads together and our collective survey inventories together, and we decided we hadn't seen 16 species of these annuals on the VVP, which is almost half of them, for at least multiple decades. Have they already gone locally extinct across the plains? So the reason I draw your attention to this is I think we need to get serious about species conservation. Grasslands as an ecosystem are highly threatened, but it's the species in them that actually contributes to why these things are important. And Aggie's already uh, sold my line here. If we want to save this ecosystem, we need to get serious about saving all the parts. And this annual example is one where we've just, it's not been on our radar at all and we're losing a whole bunch of species. So I come to my second point about what should we be thinking about? And it links beautifully to the annual story because we have to ask, well, why have annuals gone missing? And I think it's got something to do with the fact there are missing elements to the function of grasslands that we've not really spent much time thinking about. These are hard challenges, of course, so I'm not suggesting that you know these are going to be things that we can switch overnight. So what do I mean about function? Well, here's a little cute animal that you find on the Victorian volcanic plain. It's a fat tailed dunart. And if you didn't know, dunarts are carnivores. They're aggressive little beasts. They've got big teeth. They hunt things. If you're having trouble thinking about this as a predator, think of wolves, you know, as, as you know, it's an equivalent to a wolf in a different ecosystem. So they prey on items below them, obviously, and those things below them eat things and the things below them eat things. They're part of a food chain. 
these species are probably the biggest carnivore, well, they are the biggest carnivore that's native at least across the Victorian volcanic plains. You can find them under roof tiles, they're seeking refuge. So we need to know how to manage them. But I want to think about another group of animals that contribute to function. And that's the digging animals that were really, really common across the grasslands of southeastern Australia and elsewhere going into the arid country. So things such as bandicoots, eastern bar bandicoots in particular in western Victoria, but they would have been betongs, they have all the little digging animals that have gone largely extinct because of cats and foxes and habitat loss. These animals are really, really important because they dig the soil and create opportunities for renewal. They create disturbances that some species seem to need for germination, perhaps a lot of those annuals in particular, but a whole bunch of others we don't even really understand. And you can see in this example, which clearly is not taken from the VVP, that's a sandy soil, a little digging by a small animal has allowed three or four germinating seeds there to start coming up. They look like they even could be acacia uh, from that. So it suggests there's a role for digging. A beautiful essay just came out last week on highlighting this, and that's why I put it in actually, because uh, Orshi here, Orshi Decker, who's a ex-PhD student at La Trobe University, did her PhD about Australia's native gardeners, these small animals that were digging, digging up tubers, creating opportunities for renewal, putting litter back into the soils rather than blowing away or degrading, in other, or not even degrading. And so she talked about how the loss of the country's digging mammals compromises the continent's arid soil health. But I think she lost, she missed the opportunity to talk about the loss of these system drivers for generating opportunities for regeneration in grasslands. And so you can go into grasslands and you can see this kind of activity. We see diggings, we see breaking up of soil canopy, uh, plant canopies, these little foraging pits that then can um, trap nutrients and water and become microsites for germination. Now we're just starting to put some of these animals back into ecosystems. Predator-proof fences have proved pretty important. But if we're going to be serious about trying to restore grasslands, we need to think about not so much obviously on roadsides, on the high quality sites, because it'd probably be a bit challenging, but restoring larger public and private land box, maybe animals play a really critical role. And it, we're doing wonders for their conservation as well. And so some wonderful work near Wundu, Tiverton, uh, is doing exactly this. They're just about to put back uh, bandicoots into their native grasslands. And hopefully this will start a whole chain of ecological functioning that improves outcomes for native species. But I don't want us to forget about perennial native grasses. In Victoria, we have 64 genera and close to 400 species of native grasses. Most of us focus on kangaroo grass, tussock grasses, wallaby grasses and spear grasses and probably wouldn't know many others beyond that. And that's OK. They are the big groups. But perennials are really important in grasslands because they provide structural integrity and persistence elements from year to year, meaning that because they're perennial, the tussock structure is there from year to year and it pr provides some degree of um, stability to that ecosystem. Some of the most invaded grasslands that I know of have lost most of their perennial tussock grasses. And hence, all that free water, all that free nutrients is being soaked up by a whole range of exotic annual grasses like oat grass, rye grass, quaking grasses. And so some of those ecosystems need to be pushed back into a more perennial system to maintain what I call stability. That from year to year, they don't change nearly as dramatically and drastically in a functional sense. We've really not really thought much about this at all. In many cases, we want to knock back the native grasses to allow all the other species to persist. But the perennials are there the whole time, sucking up nutrients and using water. My third before I get to that, I'm going to just have a little tiny rant just for one minute. Why function matters is because the EPBC Act, our premier environmental legislation in Australia, and the FFG Act in Victoria, the premier environmental legislation in Victoria, is pretty much silent on function. 
these acts typically emphasize threatened species as entities, and that's important. We want to save the species, but rarely do we talk about them as part of functioning ecosystems. So therefore, any concepts such as web of life enhancing processes is completely absent from the legislation. So therefore, we symptom chase. We look one species at a time. How do we get that species to persist without thinking about, well, where does it fit in a functional ecosystem? By doing this, Bandicoots are a classic one. We can save the species, but it's going to have all these great benefits to ecosystem function. How does that fit for other species? So interactions and interrelationships between species, that's what ecology is, is what runs ecosystems and allows them to evolve. Currently, legislation is silent on this pretty much critical issue. So it's beholden upon us to push function as a really important reason for recovery and restoration of grasslands because it won't be pushed by anyone else at this point in time. Threatening processes will, threatening species will, but functional relationships is pretty much silent. So that's just a little rant from me. My third thing that I think we need to think a little bit more about is recovering woody species in grasslands. And it was great to hear Lincoln talk a little bit about the old growth trees around Wandu. Many of us would look at a grassland and if it was in good condition, we'd visualize it like this. Open spaces, lots of diversity, kangaroo grass, fantastic, absolutely. But much of the landscape was uh, in part treed, not the whole landscape, but there were select parts of the landscape. So this is the, from the Chalicum sketchbook uh, by Cooper in 1852 up near Langy Garan, up near Chalicum. And we can see scattered tree cover in this landscape, probably she oaks, I'm guessing, and around the wetter areas, red gums. And another view is almost of this very scattered tree cover, uh, almost savanna like. Why that's important is because we've lost most of that tree cover, which is a in critical role, plays a critical role in floral and food, other food resources for a bunch of birds and animals, arboreal animals, but also for a bunch of invertebrates. CSIRO is determined from one tree, over 400 invertebrates might live on a single tree species, in this case, a eucalypt. So if you take out that important resource from a landscape, we're providing basically a desert for many of the species that run ecosystems. And we've got to start thinking about how might we do that. Now we see some evidence of these species still lurking in the landscape. So on stony rises, we still see perspectives such as a few shrubs sort of, you know, clinging to existence. And over at Wandu, uh, near Tiverton in particular, we've got beautiful tree violets and also sweet Bessaria on stony rises. These are probably quite old, many of these trees. So we've got to value them and think about where else might they need to be in the landscape if we're truly going to restore that landscape. In many cases, we've, we've thought that woodies are not part of this system, but they are, they clearly are. There's been some great work already done by the Friends of the Forgotten Woodlands. And if you're interested in this kind of stuff, please look online and see if, uh, about joining up with them. But the Forgotten Woodlands is the woody part. So here we've got Banksia uh, marginata, the tree form, and you can see these are on their last legs. We've got she oaks in the background and we've got Themeter as an understory. So this grassland woodland probably would have been relatively continuous in its understory composition, but had important spatial distribution of the woodies. Now, obviously this is an important species of Banksia because of the floral resources it provides to honey eaters. How do they get through the landscape if we don't provide these kind of elements of the ecosystem? In some cases, these turn into absolute whopping great grandfather type trees. Uh, here's a Banksia. I mean, wouldn't you ever expect Banksia to look like this? Don't know how old it is, but it's very difficult to age. It's clearly very old based on the size of it. You can see someone about to put a tape measure around it. And I know when we did that, it came out at well around two meters in girth. Unfortunately, a year after this photo or so was taken, this plant died probably a bit of old age, it was looking very healthy at that point, but also probably either drought or some mixing of temperature. They, they seem a bit high temperature sort of sensitive in these landscapes. So this species has now, well, sorry, this individual has died from this particular site, but thankfully there are a few seedlings that are now protected that will become the next generation. 
we need to do more of this to save both the species, to save the landscape and to save the connectivity of that landscape. Speaking of connectivity, what a nice little segue. I think what we haven't done very well is think about what do we want this landscape to look like in 2050? And it's beholden on us to do this. Climates are changing. How are species going to move around landscapes? Where will they persist into the future? We need to be thinking about that in some respects. If we were just to stand back and look at an entire landscape, there's a whole bunch of things we might immediately think we could do. We should expand the area of existing grassland remnants. We might want to enhance the quality or the number of threatened species populations by appropriate targeted management. We might want to reduce the impact from surrounding environment. That could be perhaps you know, pulling down a sugar gum plantation that might be you know, sucking the moisture out of a grassland for argument's sake. Or we might also think about increasing connectivity because connectivity is what allows gene flow to occur. It also allows species to move through landscapes and hence that evolutionary process to continue. And that's how species will respond positively to things such as climate change by ongoing evolution. Currently, this landscape is very limited in those options. So what, so what should you do? Well, there's been some beautiful work done elsewhere in the state of Victoria, not in the Victorian volcanic plains that say that when you've got really low cover vegetated landscapes, so less than 10% cover, the best thing you can do is put your revegetation or your restoration and think about the configuration, how it relates to other remnants. So improve connectivity. If you've already got 15 to 30% vegetation cover in your landscape, then probably enhancing patch area becomes the more critical thing. So connectivity, when you've got not much vegetation, has been thought to be one of the best things you can do. Improving that habitat area uh, is probably more important when you've got, say, 15 to 30 percent vegetation cover. You need to do both, clearly, but we need to start thinking about what does this look like and can we map it out across the VVP? So a good example of that is grasslands around the Wandu area. So this is the Wandu Streatham Road to the northeast of Wandu, and we've got really high quality grasslands that are segregated by really low quality grasslands. And this is likely to hamper species movements between those two patches. It's hostile environments. They can't get from one to the other. They don't like the habitat or it's just impermeable to the, their movement. So that reduces pollination across those sites, that reduces seed dispersal and seedling establishment success, that might reduce animal movements. So it's a really big deal. But we've got these great remnants which are probably of national, well, are of national significance sitting a couple of hundred metres apart from one another. What should we do? Well, one of the things that we could do and we're starting to think about doing and with the CMA, uh, where this is going to get off the ground very soon, so it's very exciting times, is to think about connecting those isolated patches, creating what might be called a corridor. But it doesn't have to be a corridor. It already exists as a corridor, so it's a habitat connection. I think we should push that idea. Why would we do this? Well, the Americans are a long way in front of us. They've been doing this for some time, and this fantastic paper came out a year or so ago that documented how creating habitat corridors in grassy ecosystems, which is really interesting, improved uh, plant species diversity over time. So typically what happens is if you've got an isolated remnant, you don't do anything, you know, you, you can might manage it, but over time in America, at least it lost species. And think back to that Melbourne example, we've got lots of small remnants that don't have many species in them. The likelihood is they're gonna continue to lose species. But in their experiment, which has been running for some time, they connected up these isolated remnants and over time found that they actually gained species and they gained function. Pollination started improving seeds started dispersing between isolated patches through vectors such as lizards unbelievably so there's a lot of good reasons why we should at least consider this you know will it work here well like everything we should try it and learn if it doesn't well what have we lost just in terms of what they found 
normally you would expect over time, you know, you get you get outcomes of your connections increasing and then it sort of maxes out, you know, so you'd expect that it would only have so much benefit. But in their 18 year study, they've just seen things getting better and better and better over time. So that's a really interesting finding in its own right that by having done this, things have yet to level off. It's just been getting better and better and better. And I love their little uh, sort of conclusion here that the benefits of corridors just keep compounding like interest in a bank account, helping damaged ecosystems rebuild themselves in ways they didn't understand were going to happen. So obviously connectivity is probably really critical in this landscape because most of the habitats have is going to be hostile for native species. As Amy, Amy mentioned, we've got, we've got these, these added, added benefits, benefits of, 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 I'm getting feedback, Aggie. Yeah, I'm just telling you five minutes, okay? Oh, okay. okay. I'm almost done, so that's good. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the added benefits might be you replace high fuel loads, Phalaris and those agricultural species, and you replace them with these lower biomass native species that burn quite differently. So there is actually really good reasons to do this, to replace the fuel hazard that exists out there and replace them with a lower hazard. Okay, my last point is thinking about larger habitats of native grasslands, which typically will be on private property. They've had a history of grazing or cultivation or whatever's gone on in the past. They've got some native species in them. That's where we've got to do a lot more work is thinking about how to enhance species poor habitats, which might be quite large and connecting them up with better remnants so we can start getting this function going. Now we know not all grasslands look as spectacular as this roadside out the front of the Wycliffe Cemetery. Last spring, you know, sorry, 2019, uh, the sun orchids were going off on this particular day we were here, growing amongst the kangaroo grass. And we all aspire to these things and think, wow, isn't this great? And we've got to protect these. And absolutely we do. But then when we do go to some species poor sites, it's hard to get enthused about them in the same way. But that's because we're not thinking about their potential. The other thing we've got to remind ourselves is in many grasslands, the species that we've lost are like trees. They're not ephemeral. They're not just going to come back like weeds do. They actually take a bit of effort. So here's Thai Lotus. Macrocephalus, you can see it flowering there on the left. You might recognize it already. Below ground, it's like a tree trunk. You can see the above ground parts, the green leaves and the flower, that's a spent flower. It's all below ground. Once you lose that, that's incredibly difficult to get back overnight. So we need to think about how do we enhance those processes. Many native grassland species will be in a similar situation. We've lost these species because the history of their land use, it may well be grazing and certainly in Western Victoria, Merino sheep grazing as one of the predominant historical reasons for loss of species. And they pick out all the really juicy palatable species. So they love daisies, they love orchids, they love certain species. And so we lose those. So a question might be, how do we get them back? Well, the first thing is probably need to take grazing off. It's not surprising that you don't get, you know, too many structural or diversity outcomes when you graze like this. But is that enough? Well, perhaps we need to rethink how to rebuild those types of native grasslands. Paul here, who's going to talk next, has rebuilt grasslands from scratch where we just get rid of all the weeds and we scalp and we put species back and that's been incredibly successful. But what if you've already got a native grassland? It just doesn't have very many species. Do we really want to go back to that? It's a discussion we can have. Maybe though, what we can think about is changing the way we manage these grasslands. So we take stock off. That's probably not gonna be great because you're just gonna get lots of grass growth and that's gonna smother out any species that were there. We currently don't have any animals there digging away, keeping it open. So we might have to think about reintegrating some type of fire as is being done in this particular grassland being burnt for the first time in 30 years. What might we expect? Well, time becomes really important but what we might expect is slowly but surely species increase over time so here's just a, some study i've been doing over near dunkeld we went from sheep grazing to burning every one or two years you can see the blue is every year red is every two years and given the starting point we're starting to see 
some improvements in the number of native species in this particular grassland. So slowly but surely, species can recover. In terms of are these species yet dominating the grassland? Well, the answer that's not really. They go up and down in relation to climate cycles, as you can see. Clearly, there was a wet. The more, more recently, it's been a bit drier, so the cover's quite low. So this is going to take time. But what we need to do is to start thinking about how do we get species back into these sites? And that's going to be seed biology. We're going to have to think about what species have no capacity to come back. Their seed banks don't exist. Their dispersal is too short distance to get you across this landscape to fortuitously land in a, a paddock. So we need to start working out how to get species back into grasslands. This is the great new frontier, and I think there's a lot of exciting work to be done in this area. We know a fair bit about germination of many of these species, but we don't know how to get them back necessarily into species poor grasslands. If we crack that, things are going to be a lot better. So I'm going to challenge you next time you're out in a grassland, looking at all the lovely diversity, look for evidence of seedlings because they're the future of that grassland. To avoid the extinction debt, we have to get these things to regenerate. So just like the big old red gums in paddocks, beautiful as they are, if they're not regenerating, they're going to die at some point. So when you're in a grassland, look for the future. Come to recognise what the future looks like. It's going to be rare, might vary for species in different years, but we need to see evidence of it. It might depend on really rare coincidence of climate and suitable microsites. So we've got to value seeds. So we can't burn them off in the middle of summer and have no opportunity for regeneration the following autumn. So Aggie, I'd like to conclude by just enthusing everyone to become a grassland champion if you aren't already. And I know many of you already are. We've got to protect and we're in so much better, Nick, than we were 25 years ago. So thank you to all of you who have been working tirelessly to do this. But protection alone isn't going to be enough. We need to enhance to stop or reverse that extinction debt idea. We've got a long way to go there. We've got to restore, clearly. That might be for connectivity or to improve habitat areas. We do have the technology, but we've not much thought about where should we do it and what species should we put back. And we have to continue to agitate. This is a global issue. The extinction of grasslands on the VVP is of something that is concerned state and nationally and globally. Think more than just about your own backyard. Think about how your backyard connects to everyone else's backyards. And if we do that, we might actually start rebuild the ecosystem and we might still save most of these species and give them some options for the future. Thanks, Aggie. That's absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much for that, John. Um, now, I know a lot of you have got burning questions, but we are going to go straight over and um, let Paul get his presentation ready and, um, and we will have questions um, afterwards. But thank you very much for that, John. That was brilliant. So 